spend on a lot of textual learning, but also a space we've increasingly uh, been privileged to make uh, a forum for more public conversations on topics of the day. Um, and this is really part of a series of different talks like this we've done this year. We were privileged to host Senator Joseph Lieberman earlier in the year, reflecting on Shabbat and public life. Tonight, of course, we're honored to have uh, David Ellenson <coughs> talk about questions of conversion, halakha, and identity. And next week, I encourage you to come back when my colleague, Rabbi Shai Held, will be in conversation with Rabbi Yitz Greenberg about modernity, the covenant, uh, and the Jewish future uh, from yet another angle. So please, those people come here, please join us here uh, in the front, and uh, we're going we're gonna to get started. Um, so the way we'll uh, proceed with the format tonight is I thought I'd offer just some uh, introductory framing remarks about this topic and uh, some of uh, the anchoring, guiding sources that we may refer to in the course of the conversation and then really turn to trying to uh, draw out Rabbi Ellenson uh, on some of these issues uh, with some particular <coughs> reference to his recent book with Rabbi Danny Gordas, uh, Pledges of Jewish Allegiance, Conversion Law and Policy Making in 19th and 20th Century Orthodox Responsa, uh, which has really been uh, was a terrific uh, series of case studies that I uh, was privileged to really read and think about more deeply in preparation for this evening and then have time uh, towards the last part of the evening to be able to have some uh, Q&A from the group and, uh, and really make it a, an interactive conversation. So just to sort of frame the question of conversion and identity uh, and its relevance for the Jewish world, uh, I always find it very useful to remember that Judaism is uh, an ancient religion. And specifically it being an ancient religion, it means it's born in a time when there is not a kind of stark split between religion and ethnicity as we take that for granted today. We think of ethnicity and religion as two completely different components. One can kind of mix and match them however one wants. In the ancient world, that was not the case. What it meant to belong to the Israelite nation was to be faithful to the Israelite God. And in that sense, what we would think of as religion was just part of the fabric of what it meant to belong to the Jewish people. Um, speaking in broad terms, the revolution of the Hellenistic age and Alexander's conquest of the ancient Near East was in many ways to say that people of multiple ethnic origins could be part of the same civilization. Could somehow, even if they were not ethnic Greeks, be a part of Greek civilization in terms of dress, language, culture, and all sorts of other things. In many ways, the rabbinic conversation, which we'll be talking about a lot tonight on conversion, stems as a kind of response to that challenge of in a world in which ethnicity and religion or culture become split, how does Judaism relate to what it means to be a Jew, and therefore by extension in some ways to become a Jew? Is it about somehow joining the body of Israel in some basic uh, carnal, fleshy way? Is it primarily about taking on religious dogma and practice? Is it some combination of the two? But in many ways, I think a lot of those conversations that have raged in the Jewish people throughout the ages are derivative of that fundamental identity crisis that being an ancient people plunged into post-antiquity uh, really presents before us. Um, and a lot of what we'll see and reflect on tonight is the legacy of that very complicated story. Uh, we won't go through all of these sources, but I have a number of sources here on the sheets in front of you, but I really just want to make reference to it. We may have occasion to go back to them that really kind of lay out a lot of what is at stake here. And I kind of divided this up into just three basic sections. Um, one is kind of rabbinic reflections on standards for conversion and how we think about the substance of what it means to come into Judaism. Uh, the second category being the motivations of the convert and whether someone who's coming into Jewish life, we care and it matters on some level why it is they are. And the third piece being 
whether actually the Jewish people, as reflected in rabbinic sources, thinks about the institution of conversion and about those who enter into Judaism by choice as opposed to by birth as assets or liabilities. I just want to say a couple of framing words about those three categories, and then we'll jump into the conversational piece. Um, suffice it to say, on standards, on all of these, we have a conflicted legacy. Um, on the first page here, you have three different sources that really point us in some very different directions. Uh, the first source here in the Talmud Bavli and Yivamot lays out a familiar to many of us protocol of, kind of interviewing a convert as they come, asking their readiness to join the Jewish people, and laying out in kind of very broad terms uh, commitment to and acceptance of mitzvot, certain basic practical commitments of what it means to be a Jew, but with the caveat of ein marbin alav, ein medaktekin alav, you don't get into too fine-grained detail as to what that is, um, and then an acceptance of this person through the embodied rituals of uh, circumcision in the case of a man, and then immersion in the case of both men and women. Uh, another source, the second one on this page from the Tosefta, seems to trend much more in the direction of saying, if someone comes to try to be a Jew, and there's any aspect of Jewish practice they don't accept, even the tiniest jot and tittle of rabbinic law, that person cannot be accepted. Obviously a very different vibe from the first text. And yet an even more dramatic vibe is the story, also uh, fairly well known, of Hillel, who is confronted with a prospective convert who says to him, I want to be converted, but only learn the written law, and I have no interest in accepting the oral law. Um, and Hillel nonetheless accepts this person, converts them, and then finds a way to educate them over time, uh, which is, you could say, kind of fairly on the other extreme of seeming to have very few practical requirements other than a willingness to be open and some kind of relationship. So there in kind of category one, you already see a very conflicted uh, legacy about the question of standards. When we move to motivation, and I think some of our conversation will, uh, will turn on the examples that Rabbi Ellenson has brought in the book. So on page two, there are a number of sources that reflect on this. How much do we care about why someone is coming to join the Jewish people? And some very explicit sources that say things like, a person who comes out of a desire to marry a Jew and therefore wants to convert, such a conversion is not only not to be accepted, but in some sources, simply invalid. Someone who comes for anything other than l'shem shamayim, this kind of underdefined phrase of what it means to embrace Jewish identity for the sake of heaven, uh, that that is not a valid conversion. Um, on the flip side, some very clear sources that are aware of that source, that reject it in very clear terms and say, no, in fact, while motivations are desired to be pure, at the end of the day, they do not ultimately define the boundary of whether someone has effectively converted into Jewish life. Um, and again there, that notion of motivation, how essential is that, becomes very essential. Uh, and finally, the last piece, which I think will reflect more in the conversation here, how do we think about, I think it's very hard to assess any individual rabbi's ruling on conversion without just their broader take on sort of what Judaism has to say to the world. I think one of the things that, and, you know, and how, how desirable is it that people convert into Judaism, or how much is it sort of a fact that we're stuck with that is possible, but quite frankly, not something that we're interested in uh, as a people. I think one of the things that really uh, that kicks off this conversation in the book, which we'll come back to, um, which I hope will be the frame for our conversation tonight, is all conversations about conversion are ultimately conversations about Judaism. Right? We define through the boundaries that we set what does the inner <coughs> space of that boundary that someone is crossing look like. So with that, I want to kind of turn to opening it up here um, and first maybe just ask you for a little bit of a of personal reflection on this work. I think one of the things that's striking about this book is, first of all, it's very self-consciously limited to studying orthodox responsa in modernity. Um, and as one goes through the book, one finds no shortage of uh, difficult to nasty things that are said about reform conservative rabbinic authorities. I'd love to hear from you, how did you come to this? What kind of intrigued you about both the topics of conversion, specifically orthodox responses, what is a tremendous leader in the reform movement doing studying uh, these kinds of responses that are not always so complimentary? 
فإن شاء الله Province. First, I want to say how happy I am uh, to be here tonight and the tremendous admiration I have for Mahon Hadar and its uh, leadership. Uh, I hope tonight that I won't use the term Gordon when speaking to you. <laughs> Some of you may know that, that, would be that an honor. <laughs> you may know that Ethan's father's a rabbi, but I won't uh, dwell on that. And we have connections that go back for many years. His roommate, when he was at Harvard, I was a young man, Doe Grossman, who is practically a nephew to me from Los Angeles, but I think even more significantly in, I think it was 1978, 79, when my oldest daughter attended the Solomon Schechter School in Boston, uh, I actually drove his uh, future bride-to-be, Ariella, to uh, the Schechter School every day for, give or take, an entire year. She was in kindergarten at that point. <laughs> She's since matured and become a wonderful attorney, graduate of uh, a law school. So if I'm a bit of vuncular, I'll probably not. Right. <laughs> but I do want to say there's a long relationship. No, it, I mean, it is an interesting question how I came to write on this topic. And there are, there are a number of factors. Um, one is, and I wouldn't minimize this, I did grow up in an Orthodox uh, background in the small southern city, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, the town I grew up in, there were about six to seven hundred Jewish families. Knowing what I now know about Jews, I'm surprised there were only four synagogues. Uh, <laughs> there was a synagogue that was Orthodox with a machitza, synagogue that had a Yeshiva University graduate, but had mixed seating. In fact, that rabbi was uh, Rabbi Mervis. His granddaughter is uh, a very popular writer of fiction, uh, Tova Mervis. Uh, so there are all kinds of connections, but I knew her father well when I was. Uh, a boy, uh, there was a conservative synagogue and, and a reform one. My family belonged to the Orthodox shul with the Mechitza. Most of our rabbis were from various world in Baltimore. And uh, I guess I received a fairly traditional Jewish education from, I'd say, a certain type of Orthodox perspective when I was a boy, though it was in the midst of a much larger world where there were fights over desegregation, integration. I saw Lincoln the other night. Uh, saw Robert E. Lee get on his horse traveler uh, at Maddox. That did not lead me to uh, <laughs> write a book on conversion. But it is to say that I grew up, as it were, in two cultural worlds. Um, I've actually never talked about this publicly, but I think I might tonight just for one moment. Uh, I had been married to my wife Jackie for over 30 years, but I was married once uh, before to a woman who converted to Judaism. Uh, my own rabbis were not uh, overly warm and welcoming, uh, and my first wife did convert initially with a uh, reform rabbi. Uh, my rabbis, as a boy, interpreted the tradition uh, much in line with the passages in and deny that we cite here that someone would reject even a single jot or tittle of halakha um, should not be accepted. And then, you know, I'm not going to know uh, don't accept her. And I think that uh, part of it, I mean, on a very, very personal level, in this study was to say that the tradition was probably broader than the way the tradition was presented to me on this specific issue. But in addition, as a boy, Often when, uh, when we would study, we would begin with a mantra, Reishi kol sarif ladat shekola Torah kula ben shem yisav ben shem alpeh yisnam e kadosh baruch hu atzmo al yudei moshe rabbeinu alav ha-shalom v'har sina ayev shal ha-shanot afilu kats echad lola ha-keo v'lola ha-kmir. First thing you need to know is that all of the Torah was given by God to Moses at Sinai, written in oral, it is impossible to set change even a single jot or tittle, neither to be lenient nor to be stringent. And that was basically the attitude that most of my teachers took. Uh, as I became older and I began to study in a more critical way, um, I don't think I could affirm, in fact, I don't say I don't think I could affirm, 
I could not affirm that uh, catechism any longer uh, in my life. I say all of this because in some ways, and in terms of my scholarship in general, I don't, I don't know how to measure it precisely, but I would say 80% of what I write on deals with Jewish orthodoxy. Uh, my first book was on an orthodox rabbi in Germany, Oswald Hildesheimer, who uh, established the equivalent of Yeshiva University in Germany, and in subsequent years I've written a great deal on this uh, topic. I say all of that because while I hope that my scholarship is as impartial and objective as it is possible for scholarship to be, I do recognize that the factors that have led me to study what I study represent in many, many senses uh, a personal chance for me to engage in what at this point in my life, I'm now 65, have been thousands of imagined conversations with different uh, teachers of mine in a very specific way. When I completed my doctorate at Columbia in 1982 or 83, there was a symposium at the Jewish Theological <coughs> Seminary organized by Shia Cohen on the issue of conversion to Judaism. There were many, uh, there were not many Orthodox Jews who were prepared to analyze this material in an academic way, and Ismar Shorish, who had been my teacher, recommended me to Shia Cohen, and I delivered a paper at JTS in 81, 82, 83 on the topic of Orthodox response on conversion. I discovered I had so much material that I ended up writing two or three academic papers in the 90s, Danny Gordis did his doctorate at USC. He, I taught a seminar on an Orthodox rabbi named W. C. Hoffman and his academic writings. Uh, Hoffman was Hildesheimer's successor as head of the Hildesheimer Seminary in Berlin uh, and his work in Lame Bahoyo. At the end of the semester, I just turned to Danny and said, you know, I've written a lot of stuff on conversion. You've written all of this material on Rabbi Hoffman probably wouldn't take more than two or three months. Why don't we just write a book on conversion? That was give or take in 1992. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's 2012. Finally in 2010, Danny and I just decided either now's the time, if not now, when? So we decided to finish it up. And I do think that in looking at this response, uh, I love the way these people struggle with the tradition. I think it shows the tradition even when interpreted by Orthodox authorities who have identical theological views, read the tradition in various ways. There is no way to escape, in Goddard's terms, a hermeneutical circle. And um, I think it does say a great deal about concepts of Jewish peoplehood and approaches to Judaism that these posts can take. One of the reasons we focus just on Orthodox thinkers here is that we also wanted a controlled variable, that is to say, these are all people who share, again, identical theological positions. Uh, and therefore, the fact that they read the tradition in multivalent ways, which is a reflection of the multivalency in the sources themselves, allowed us to, uh, to look at this in a, uh, in a controlled kind of way. But I would not deny that I have personal uh, conflicts that I still work out with my own approach to uh, Jewish tradition. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let's, I, I'd actually like to pick up on that point of you know, taking the control experiment of, uh, you know, I have three different rabbis who might, in theory, think a similar way, but then put into different environments, uh, have a different reaction. Um, the book, for those who haven't read it, is sort of organized around different times and places. Uh, so you have a chapter on Western Europe, a chapter on Central Europe coming uh, into modernity. Uh, and there's a chapter in particular on the United States and Europe in modernity. And in that chapter, um, I'd say the, the organizing principle around a lot of your analysis uh, borrows from Charles Liebman and his yes. sort of theories of how a person, particularly a rabbinic authority, um, responds to a question depending on how how much obligation and responsibility they feel they have for what kind of constituency. Um, so, you know, in broad terms, I, you can tell me if this is fair, but in broad terms, essentially a rabbi like Rabbi David Svi Hoffman in Germany, who still felt very much plugged into the Gemeinde, the kind of uh, community 
uh, Jewish corporate reality uh, had a certain kind of obligation to the entire Jewish people that made him uh, respond in one way, as opposed to, let's say, I think the most prominent example you gave of this sort, uh, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein here in the United States, who's dealing with a completely, totally voluntaristic orthodoxy in an America that in no way structures or controls the Jewish community, kind of has the leeway to preach to the choir uh, in a way that uh, Rabbi Hoffman maybe doesn't. What I was wondering if maybe you could reflect on a bit is, um, I wonder if that, how much is that a product of modernity, certain kinds of modernity? Do you think in some ways that that was true in antiquity as well? I think one of, one of Shia Cohen's lines, as you mentioned, and it's one of my favorite lines, is we have a great affinity often for the classical sages because uh, they lived in a pre-rabbinic world and we lived in a post-rabbinic world. Right? A sense in which the medieval world was the heyday of Jews being forcibly bound in this political alignment. I'm wondering how much of this is a story of modernity and how much is it a story of just not the medieval times? Boy, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> meaning I don't have an exact answer for it at this moment and I'm reflecting on it as I speak to you. Uh, there is no question that, that in the early rabbinic period, I mean, there was you know, as Professor Cohen has phrased it, um, you have a community that is uh, in the process of genuinely of formation and lots of interactions with the larger world. Um, I am not an expert on Judaism and antiquity, so I'm reluctant to comment uh, in great depth. What I, what I am prepared to talk about, though, and maybe we can get back to this, it, it is the larger issue that you raise. And I, I would mention the essay by Charles Liebman. This was an essay published in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion in March of 1983. It's entitled Extremism as a Religious Norm. The only thing I'm sorry about in the entire book, and I will say this, beyond whatever mistakes there are on different uh, pages, uh, is that Danny and I then used his phrase extremism, which I think has connotations that I'm not completely happy with. Stringency might have been, as opposed to leniency, might have been a better word. But leave that aside. Charles Liebman, if he's one you haven't heard of, was a professor for many years at Yeshiva University, then made Aliyah and taught at Bar Ilan. And I think I'm prepared to say he was really the leading commentator sociologist on the American Jewish scene. I mean, I actually think we even had more insights than virtually anyone I've ever uh, read in terms of illuminating the condition of Judaism in the modern world. He puts forth a thesis in this article, Extremism as a Religious Norm, which goes as follows. And it does relate to the Middle Ages uh, as opposed to modernity. And I do want to get to Hoffman and Feinstein. Basically, his point is that religious leaders, by definition, have an atiyah, they have an inclination to be, in quotes, religious. That's not surprising. And that religious leaders left to their own devices would almost always tend towards stringency or greater spirituality in their own life. That their whole personality is oriented in that kind of direction, that in imbibing the attitude that is the slogan, let's say, for the Shulchan Aruch, Shivisi Hashem Lenegdik Tamid, I place God before me always. They are, as it were, sort of God intoxicated. They want to do the maximum that will bring them as close to the divine as possible. However, that is not true, Lehman feels, of your average person. In the Middle Ages, when posty Jewish religious decisors lived in the community and were part of the community, and you had, as Ethan just pointed out, as Rabbi Tucker pointed out, a kahila or a gemeinde, a communal organization, the rabbi had to poskin, had to issue halakhic decisions for a broad variety of behaviors. So even if their own inclination was to be stringent with themselves, they had to take account of, I'll put this in quotation marks, backsliders, or people who were not 
as stringent in their orientation. And in fact, their responsibility was such that they had to account for everyone in the community. This led these people quite often, according to Liebman's thesis, to be stringent in their personal life, but perhaps lenient in the rulings they issued. I have to be honest, as a student of medieval halakha might tell you, I'm not certain it fits in exactly <coughs> the way he depicts it. But let's assume for a moment it does. His thesis was that in the modern world, and particularly in North America, where you no longer have a combined structure, you no longer have a communal structure, rabbis in the world we live in do not have coercive political authority. And everyone, by the way, is able to make Shabbos for themselves. I mean, we didn't talk about it in the book, but the reform movement can make a decision on patrilineality for its constituency <coughs> and not particularly worry about what Orthodox members of the community do or do not feel. In other words, the Liebman thesis can apply in both directions. But Professor Liebman's point is that in general he felt that in looking at the rulings of Orthodox authorities, Orthodox authorities who view themselves as rabbis for the totality of the Jewish community, its observant as well as non-observant elements, tended to rule leniently in a whole host of areas, as opposed to people who viewed Jewish peoplehood principally in terms of observance of mitzvot, of Jewish religious commandments, and because they were issuing piskei din, because they were issuing decisions, basically only for an orthodox constituency that would accept their rulings, that in fact it allowed or freed people to be either lenient or stringent. So when you mention Rabbi Hoffman, Rabbi Hoffman lived from 1843 to 1921. He, he was an incredibly great scholar. I mean, it would be difficult to exaggerate how much Rabbi Hoffman knew. He grew up in Hungary, and he became involved nevertheless in modern life. He received his doctorate from the University of Tübingen in Germany. He wrote a doctoral dissertation on um, Rav Samuel, and he wrote on the concept of Dina, uh, de Malchut de Dina, the law of the land is the law. He was a modern scholar. He taught for Samson Raphael Hirsch in Frankfurt early on in his career, and ultimately became <coughs> head of the Orthodox Yeshiva, the Orthodox Seminary in, uh, in Berlin. He also served as a community rabbi. He was dealing with people constantly in his life. When you read his corpus on conversion, you can tell, in all honesty, in my opinion, that he's seldom comfortable with the ruling he issues. And by this, I mean the following. In the best of all possible worlds, he would say that anyone who wanted to convert to Judaism should agree to observe all of them as well. But he recognizes the reality of the larger Jewish world, and he even uses the phrase in one of his responses, said, I have to keep, in quotes, and these are his terms, the evil to a minimum. People are intermarrying, but they are still participating in the community. He is engaged in what I would call constituency retention. He wants to bring people in, and he issues any number of rulings in one instance, it's unclear whether someone is or is not Jewish. He wants to engage in Kabbalat or mitzvot, in an acceptance of the yoke of the commandments. The person, it's not clear if he's really matrilineally descended. He would rather the person undergo a process of conversion. He instructs his student and says, what should I do? I know this person isn't going to be observing. He says, well, you need a hota atam mitzvot. You need to inform him of the commandments. Ask him the following, and these are the exact instructions he gives. He says, ask him, does he believe that you should honor your father and your mother? If he says yes, ask him another question. Does he believe you should love your neighbor as you love yourself? If he says yes to both of those questions, just perform the conversion. You perform Kabbalah on this book, the acceptance of the yoke of the commandments. He doesn't say to ask him about Shabbat. He doesn't say to ask him about Kashrut. He doesn't say to ask him about Nida in a very moving Shudra. He deals with a woman who wants to convert. This is one of my favorite in the whole 
corpus of literature. He, um, there's a woman who's non-Jewish, married to a Jewish man, and she gives birth to a baby who dies uh, in the first month of life. The baby has been circumcised. She now wants to be converted to Judaism. So in quote, she can be buried in the Jewish cemetery with her son. But from the standpoint of halakha, what's the challenge or problem here? For those of you who undoubtedly know the day of Gabriel Rosen, conversion. Is the baby actually Jewish? No, why not? Non-Jewish mother, the baby has been circumcised, but the baby has not been taken or had not been taken to a mikvah. Rabbi Hoffman writes, he said to his student, who's asking him the question, what should I do with this woman? He said, you have to bring the woman to you, and you have to talk to her. If you can, try to explain to her that circumcision is what one might call an enabling act. It is an act that's necessary to formally convert the child to Judaism. But that without to be law, without myth that the baby is not Jewish. But he said, you have to really watch this woman. If you see, and these are the words in Hebrew, Shehitish Tagea, if you see that her distress over the loss of her baby is such that she will become insane, just do the conversion. Just do the conversion. The point I would make here is that someone like Rabbi Hoffman is dealing with a large number of Jews. He is a great scholar, very learned. He has a woman before him that he sees in flesh and blood. And he makes the decision to frankly post him, issue a halakhic ruling that would not be, strictly speaking, in keeping with the most stringent demands of halakha. In contrast, someone like Rabbi Feinstein, by and large, is most of the time teaching right down on the Lower East Side in Yeshiva. For the most part, I don't want to, Feinstein is a complicated kind of character. But we now live in a world where many of the posts do not only Posca, most of the Posca, where decisors are making decisions only for those who will follow their decisions. But in addition, they're not really dealing or meet people, for the most part, who are actually non-observant, who nevertheless participate in what one, might, what one might call the larger fading life of the Jewish people. I think the Lehman thesis would argue that this is part of what leads to greater stringency. By the way, Rabbi Feinstein, commenting on Rabbi Hoffman's rulings in several cases, just says, I read what Rabbi Hoffman wrote, I'm astonished that he would rule in this way. The point I guess that I would make is that both of them are basing their decisions on halakhic precedent, which I'd be happy to go into, but you can't escape whatever I call it here, not only the time and place, but the individual psychology of what it is that moves someone when they're, when they're about to make a decision. By the way, this isn't unprecedented in Jewish law. This isn't our topic tonight, but one could do a paper looking at the Rambam, Maimonides' halakhic rulings, as opposed to the way in which he codifies law in the Mishnah Torah. There are at least a dozen times, I don't know how else to say this, where Maimonides rules against himself. I mean, that is to say that in his response of, when asked to issue rulings, it runs counter to the halakha as he himself has codified it in the Mishnah Torah. For example, Rabbi Tucker mentioned before that classically you're not permitted to do a conversion for someone who comes for the sake of marriage. And based on a passage in the Bomo 24b, if we have on the sheet. Oh, you have on the sheet. <laughs> Good. Okay. okay. I can't read without my glasses. Uh, I'm glad it's there. If I miss the let me know. But it's based on the passage in Yavamot 24b, if an individual has a shivcha, has a maidservant, and she then converts to Judaism, he's not permitted to marry her. Halakhically, I won't get into all the reasons or justifications why here, 
But what's interesting is Maimonides, in a real life case where this occurs, says, yes, convert her to Judaism and perform the marriage. I imagine, and I don't know this because we don't have enough in the sources historically reconstructed, but I make a leap of imagination, and what I actually imagine is the man standing before Maimonides in Cairo with this woman next to him, and whatever the medieval equivalent would be, I'm in love with her and she's in love with me. And he just says, yes, let's do the conversion, and I'll perform the uh, Kiddushin. So I think one can't completely ignore whatever that human psychological component is. And I do think the book points to that. I won't say that it's a definitive conversation, but it does bring up the whole issue of whatever the personal psychology of the post so let me just push a little on the kind of combination of the psychology and the Liebman thesis, because the thing that immediately comes to mind, and where you have a whole other chapter in the book on this, is, uh, of course, Israel would seem to be uh, the forum in which the Liebman thesis that the more responsible you are to more people, Good. the more kind of practically oriented your conclusions would be, would play out in spades. Yes. And yet, if anything, I think a lot of us now, when we see even you know the word conversion and Jewish identity on a poster today, right, the first thing we think of is a conversion crisis in Israel, the X number of 100,000 people from the FSU. Um, and one of the things that was striking me actually in reading that chapter was I felt, uh, I felt that you and Rabbi Gordas worked very hard to kind of make a, a coherent thesis of what was going on in Israel. And in some ways, it seemed like a lot of people reacting to uh, the power that the state kind of affords and you know, the megaphone it sort of puts up to people who are having these conversations. Um, but in some ways in very haphazard ways, right? Clearly having people who have enormous amount of responsibility to on some level the entire Jewish people, yeah. nonetheless responding to that with sort of versions of uh, another text that, uh, that we have on here about in the days of David and Solomon, yes. no converts were accepted. And when the Jewish people enjoy sovereignty and power on some level, anyone who's coming to join them has to be treated with suspicion. And others like Rabuziel, the first Sephardic chief rabbi, who his take on that is exactly in line with the Liebman yes. thesis. He is sort of like, we have to make sense of this. So, so what do you think? Do you read that? Is, is that either a total repudiation of the thesis and maybe what you're articulating now as the kind of almost psychological disposition of the posseg is actually prominent? Or is there another dynamic? Maybe, you know, responsibility is one thing, but bureaucracy functions in a different way. I, I'd love to I'm only thoughts. smiling here because I, I don't know, all of a sudden I was thinking of, uh, I don't even remember if I have her name right, Rosanna. Yeah, on Saturday Night Live, like, whoops, you know? Yeah, well, that thesis doesn't really work as well in Israel. Uh, and in fact, it, it sort of astonishes me that it doesn't. One would anticipate that in Israel, where people are responsible, the rabbis there for an entire society of observant and non-observant people, you would expect what you get in the early years of the state of Israel, so that Rabbi Tucker mentioned uh, Rabbi Uziel, the first chief Sephardic rabbi, who was unbelievably lenient. And in fact, there's just a brand new book uh, that at least 10 of us are interested in, maybe 100, <laughs> written by Svi Zohar. Below Yidach, Nimenu Yidach, which deals with Rabbi Uziel's rulings on uh, conversion. Steve Zohar is professor at Hartman and Bar Elon and uh, it just appeared in Hebrew, frankly, about a month ago. Uh, and Rabbi Uziel is probably one of the most lenient post team on the issue of conversion in the history of the uh, of Jewish jurisprudence. In fact, he and Rabbi Hoffman, their rulings are very uh, very similar to one another. But quite clearly, he feels a sense of responsibility towards the totality of the Jewish people. And he uses the precedents like the one in uh, the Bavli and Shabbat, uh, or the one in Menachot with Rabbi Chia, <coughs> to, to really bring people in virtually in every uh, instance. What's interesting is you have a whole history in Israel. People like the chief rabbi Unterman, when you had a large Russian aliyah, even in the 70s, also ruled very, very leniently. It fits in exactly with the Liebman thesis. It's exactly what you would expect 
And um, frankly, Rabbi Gorin, who wasn't always so lenient, on conversion in Israel, for a whole variety of reasons, Rav Gorin tended to be uh, fairly lenient as well, but he based it, Rabbi Gorin, not on these passages in the Talmud Bavli, but there is a passage in the Talmud Yerushalmi, in the Jerusalem Talmud, in Masachet Gerim, that says, Eretz Yisrael Machsheret Gerim, the land of Israel, how did you translate it? You must translate it in the book. Eretz Yisrael Machsheret Gerim, Eretz, the land of Israel, is conducive to conversion. It likes conversion. It makes converts kosher. And Rabbi Gorin argues in a whole host of cases that uh, when someone comes to live in the state of Israel, they have wed themselves to the destiny of the Jewish people. And consequently, he is incredibly lenient. And he accepts people. And frankly, lenient here means that people don't accept Taryag Mitzvot. The, the problem with the classical Halachic definition and here I do make a judgment, is that it's very narrow. To be a Jew classically, and this goes back to one of the points you made at the beginning of it, classical Judaism asserts that someone is Jewish in two ways. They either are born of a Jewish mother, Judaism has a birth dogma, an ethnos, peoplehood, however one would want to understand that, or someone who was formally obligated to observe Seven Commandments, the Sheva Mitzvot Pnei Noach, as a non-Jew, all humankind, according to the Jewish tradition, is obligated to observe the seven Noach commandments. A person who was formally obligated to observe seven commandments is now obligated to observe 613. Conversion here is understood in a narrow religious sense, and a person who will adopt this in theory can be brought into the Jewish people. But the reality is that we see how it is that people live. We begin our book with a story, which isn't unfortunately uncommon, with a young man born of a Russian non-Jewish mother and a Jewish Russian Jewish father who serves in the IDF, the State of Israel's Defense Forces, who dies defending the right of Haredi rabbis who will deny his Jewishness uh, in defense of the State of Israel. And he can't be buried in 1993 in a Jewish cemetery in Israel. This irritates many Israelis because they would say, not in a formal way, there's been a tevilat ash, as it were. There's an immersion by fire. This man has come to live in Israel, he speaks Hebrew, he lives as a secular Jew, he fights in defense of the Jewish people, who Allah Mishmar, he's on guard for the Jewish people. Rabbi Gorin felt that there were halakhic sources that allowed this person to convert. By the way, Rabbi Gorin, on his Dot Gerut, on his conversion certificates, would write, this conversion is valid only in the state of Israel. By the way, there is no halakhic precedent for this. <laughs> but you do have the interesting case where you had one individual who converted who moved to England. I don't think we discuss this in the book, but this is a real case. Yeah, you mentioned Oh, we do yeah. mention the book. Yeah. I don't know what I wrote anymore or not. <laughs> it's fascinating and gripping every word. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good read. It is a good read. Good read. But, but in any event, this person then goes to move to England. The family wants to send their children to an Orthodox yeshiva, and they present the Teuda, the Certificate of Conversion, signed by Rabbi Gorin. And the response given is, this isn't valid in England. While your mother is Jewish in Israel, she's not Jewish in England, and they refuse to accept the child into the yeshiva in England. What this has led to, and this is the other point that uh, Rabbi Tucker mentions when we talk about, is that in recent years, and this runs completely counter to The Orthodox rabbinate in Israel that is charged by the state with enforcing laws of conversion has issued rulings that I would say, this I don't say in the book, but I would say to you here tonight, that I think rank among the cruelest in the whole history of Jewish jurisprudence. They have engaged in a process, Rabbi Sherman, for example, for over 15 years, conversion in Judaism, to Judaism in Israel, was under the authority of a national Zionist rabbi, Chaim Brooklyn. 
Rabbi Druckmann took basically the kind of stance that would be completely in keeping with the Lutheran thesis. He was lenient in regard to conversion. He felt that people who participate in the faith and life of the Jewish people, uh, he found standards that allowed them to be converted. Over 15,000 people were converted under governmental authority to Judaism in the state of Israel under the authority of Rabbi Kirkland. In a case that came ultimately before the High Rabbinic Court, which is now charged with authority by the state of Israel, Rabbi Sherman engaged in what's called Betula Kerupa Mafreya, a retroactive annulment of conversion. And this is the reasoning. In one instance, you had a woman who was in the process of getting a divorce. It's embarrassing to actually talk about this case, in my opinion. Her grandmother had converted to Judaism. So her family had lived in Israel for three generations. Her grandmother was a convert, perhaps even under Rob Cook. The woman comes in to get a divorce from the rabbinical court, and she's suing for alimony. She is not wearing long sleeves. The court begins to investigate her level of observance, and she's, somewhere, she's sort of like a traditional Israeli. She's not thrown by any standard, but she's also not, in this instance, particularly non-observant. But the court feels that the fact that she wears, she doesn't have her head covered, she, sleeves are showing, her arms are showing. She can't possibly be thrown. They investigate her mother and her <coughs> grandmother. And they come to the conclusion that her mother, grandmother's conversion could not possibly have been sincere. Because if it had been sincere, then a granddaughter like this would not have emerged. Her grandmother's conversion is retroactively held. The result is, of course, that her mother is not Jewish. She's not Jewish, and in a great miscarriage of justice, I don't know quite how this happened, but they ruled that the husband doesn't have to pay alimony to the wife because they were never really legally married, even though they had children together. It, it, it's not a pretty episode, in my opinion, in the history of Jewish jurisprudence uh, in Israel. The, the problem you have in Israel is that more or less, you now have hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as 500,000 Jews in Israel. When I call them Jews, they are Jews in a sociological, nationalistic sense, and they do not have halakhic status as Jews. This is brought on principally by the Russian Aliyah, and it means that all 15,000 converts under Rabbi Brooklyn, because of Rabbi Sherman's rulings, their Jewishness, I'm not saying it is challenged, but it could be challenged in these courts. There is a rabbi named Chaim Amsala who uh, wrote a book, two volumes called Zerah Yisrael, The Seed of Israel. I could get into this in a moment, but Rabbi Amsala was a Shas member of the Knesset, uh, a Tunisian rabbi, and really a guy, oh, quite a bit of genius. Very impressive volumes that he wrote. Uh, he rules halakhically, there is every source in the world that would justify their conversion to Judaism. But in light of your thesis, and this has to do, I think, to some degree with the politics of the state of Israel, um, it runs completely counter to the Liebman thesis, because you would expect people who were charged with the totality of the Jewish state to be more like Rabbi Solomon or Rabbi Unterman or Rabbi Dorn, at least in regard to conversion in the state of Israel. I, I would try to respond to it in the following way. One, um, coalition politics in the state of Israel for a whole variety of reasons that go beyond my own expertise have empowered uh, certain Haredi forces that are frankly also, I should add, anti-Zionist. I mean, there, there's a great irony here that some of the chief rabbis in the state of Israel have actually not been Zionists. Meaning, uh, they don't ascribe any religious worth or meaning to the state of Israel at all. It's as if it were a Gentile government, and they treat it as such. They accord it no real religious significance. The state of Israel whatsoever, they are if not anti, at least non-Zionist. But they do have a degree of political power. And I do want to say, 
they do, in a theological sense, believe that uh, Jewish religious tradition demands this. They are not motivated principally by politics, but by their own sense of Jewish religious authenticity. And I guess the other point I'd make here, it does reflect different concepts of Jewish people. You have to ask yourself, and this is not just a rhetorical question, I know how I would answer it, but it's a question you'd have to ask yourselves. Does a young man who speaks Hebrew, serves in the Israeli army, identifies as a Jew and is identified by others as a Jew, and risks his life for Jewish fate and destiny in the Jewish state, does that constitute uh, enough to, in quotes, make him a Jew? Is he part of the Jewish people in some way? Or do you have, uh, strictly speaking, what I'm going to call a stringent, I don't know if it's narrow, but a stringent Jewish notion, the Jewish people that is constituted of being the child of a Jewish mother or someone who converts to Judaism who observes all 613 months old. By the way, I should point out that Rabbi Sherman's ruling actually does mean that no conversion is ever final. It runs, in my opinion, if you look at the Yvonne passage, completely counter to at least 2,000 years of the law of Jewish truths. Yisrael Afapisha Chatai, Yisrael, who a Jew, even when a Jew sins, remains a Jew. This has been applied to converts throughout history. Rabbi Sherman reverses 2,000 years of Jewish history in this uh, It does make the legal thesis difficult in this situation. I encourage folks to think of that question we're about to take a round. Just one more comment on that, gather your thoughts, and then I'll, uh, I'll take a round of this. Um, I think I hadn't thought of it before. I think it's very interesting the notion that actually Israeli coalition politics um, actually can often empower uh, a party that doesn't actually self-conceive as it taking responsibility for the whole. Yes. Right? And then one of the things, let's say someone like Rabbi Goran very much he conceived of himself as having kind of responsibility for the whole project. Yes, by the way, I do want to point out that all the earliest chief rabbis of Israel, Goran, Unterman, Rabbi Herzog, Rabbi Uziel, they were Zionists. They were really Zionists. They believed in the religious significance of the Jewish state and the religious significance of even the activities in which secularists engaged in the building of the state of Israel or in which they were involved. You have chief rabbis now who, because of coalition politics, actually are not Zionists for a whole variety of reasons. Right, right. And, and I think the other point that you're raising, which I, I know in some of my own teaching and thinking about this is kind of complicated, in my view, is this notion of sort of the retroactively annulled conversion and how does it fit in with um, more broadly someone's kind of view of the Jewish community or Jewish essence of what it means to be a Jew. Um, one, of the, one of the other areas of Jewish law that I think is an interesting intertext here is how various uh, rabbinic authorities over the years have treated Jews who are clearly born Jews, but who completely abandoned Jewish practice.